God bless you, people of the Most High. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you and welcome you back to our Bible study. My name is Clarence. I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church. i uh, just like to take this opportunity to bless God in heaven. I had an incident happen to me uh, yesterday. I was on my way home from work and I came up to a stoplight. And as I'm just waiting for the light to turn green, I was behind another vehicle. The airbag in my driver's side seat, the seat that I was sitting at, the, the side of the driver's seat, the airbag deployed. Uh, boom was the sound that I heard and, and the ringing went through my ear. Uh, I wasn't impacted by a vehicle or anything. It just deployed. Um, I give honor to God because just as my wife said, I could have been driving and that had happened and, you know, it would have startled me enough to probably have caused a severe accident. But the fact that I was waiting at a, at a stoplight, standing still at a light and to have that happen. And these things, it, it shows me that God is, is there for us. Um, he's there more for us than we can be there for ourselves and even others. Um, we begin to, I bless him that he opens our eyes to see how he is there protecting us. Um, there are things that God is doing uh, to protect us that we can't even see. Because the way he does it, it's, it's seamless to where it doesn't distract or detour us from those things that we are to do for him. I just bless him. I, God, I bless you. I honor you. I honor you with my service. I honor you with my commitment and my heart because you are a loving and a kind and a merciful God. And not only are you God, but you are Father. And, you, and Jesus bless you because you gave your life. You shed your blood and that allowed us to be able to call God our Father, call him Abba. Lord, thank you for your provisions and your protections. Thank you for your precepts, God. Thank you for your love and your son, Jesus Christ. When we were rebellious, you didn't wash your hands of us and sent us along our way. You were still allowing your rain to fall, your sun to shine, still allowed us to breathe your air, to eat your food, to wear the clothing that you had gotten for us, God. You didn't take none of those things away from us when we were at our worst. You still loved us with a tender heart, God. Daddy, I say thank you. Jesus, I say thank you. I look forward to seeing you. I look forward to serving you daily, Jesus. I look forward to you coming and righting the wrong that's going on in this world today, Lord. Jesus, thank you for being the word of the Father. His guiding light, the righteousness of God. Thank you for living in us, Jesus. Thank you for being our God. I bless you, Lord. Folks, again, I welcome you and welcome you back to our Bible study. Today we'll be going, uh, we'll be going into Leviticus, the fifth chapter, quite possibly the sixth chapter of Leviticus as well. Uh, we'll have to see where the Holy Spirit leads us at. You know, this is the time that I do the protocols. Uh, those of you that don't have Bibles, don't worry about it. We got you covered. You can go to our website, www dot ubc church dot org once you get to our once you get to our uh, website folks look for those tabs that are underneath the banner and uh, as you're looking at those tabs one of the tabs that you will see is the online bible tab uh, when you get an opportunity click on that tab that'll bring up another page with a box at the center of the page within that box you'll see a drop down arrow once you click it that arrow will drop down a menu that's populated with the different books of the bible and of course you want to select uh, leviticus and right beneath that you want to select chapter at least chapter five 
uh, that we'll start off with. That way you'll be able to follow us verse per verse. I've been saying this for a long time. It's important, very, very, very important uh, to be able to follow us verse per verse. Reason being is because you are allowing a man, me, you are allowing a man to feed you the word of God. Uh, you want to check what I'm serving you, if you will. The only way you'll be able to check what I'm serving you is to be able to follow word per word, verse per verse. Amen. Uh, it's okay to listen to this on an MP3, but when you get an opportunity, folks, we're living in days of deception. And deception doesn't always, a salesman that's trying to sell you something that's deceptive, he's not coming, uh, you know, looking like a con artist. He's coming with his game right. He's coming, uh, you know, prepared to deceive. Amen. He's, he's coming to try to convince you. Uh you know, to, to try to win your trust over, if you will. So what am I saying? I'm saying at the end of the day, trust no man, you trust God. My job here is to help give you some understanding uh, concerning the word of God. But it's your job to test the spirit. That means you got to be walking with, the, with God to be able to test the spirit. Amen. And it's not just with me, folks. It's with anybody that you are allowing to teach you God's word. Go behind and check, check them out in the Bible. I mean, you know, check the verses out there trying to preach and teach to you. If, if they saturate the truth with their opinion, you know, you got to know when to shut the valve off on that, if you will. Amen. And at the end of the day, a man to have a sincere heart, but the but he's, you know, the enemy will try to find ways to get in there and saturate God's truth. So, you know, again, folks, when you don't want to have the pastor's relationship with God, you don't want to have a man's relationship with God. You want to have your own relationship with God. Amen. And therefore, you want to make sure that you're reading God's word. Again, we're here to help you learn it, you know, as much as we can or as, as much as the spirit open up for yourself. Uh, but at the end of the day, you still check to make sure that things are lining up, that what's being taught is lining up with God's truth. Amen. Uh, those of you that require and desire prayer, uh, folks, those of you that have uh, um, filled out prayer requests, uh, you know, to this ministry that we would pray with you and pray for you. You, you get an opportunity to see that this is a praying ministry. Uh, when we email you in return and let you know uh, that we have taken your petitions uh, to God in heaven, we've laid them at his throne through Jesus Christ. Um, we don't play with that. Any petitions that you give us to take to God, it is though we're praying for ourselves. Amen. Um, we take that to God. Uh, I'm not deceived to, you know, to believe that, that I'm okay. I don't need prayer. Just as you folks need prayer, I need prayer too. And things begin to try to challenge us. Things will try to rock our faith. No matter how, how you think you got this walk down pat, there's going to be something that's going to rock you. It's going to try to attack your faith. It, it wants you to give up. Evil wants you to give up. It wants you to throw the towel in. Evil wants you to say, I can't do this because evil is looking for company in the lake of fire. And it wants the very people that God sent his sons to save. God never sent his son to save angels or those that were corrupted, spiritual beings that 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 became demons. Uh, uh, God never sent Jesus to save them. So we are constantly under attack by them. Amen. They are looking for company in the lake of fire. So they're going to attempt to try you. But praises be praises, glory and honor be to the Lord Jesus Christ, because Jesus overcame everything that was done against him. He overcame that. Therefore, he made it possible for us to overcome. In order to tap into this victory, 
we have to position ourselves to receive victory through prayer. That's the resource. That's, that's the outlet. Amen. That's us tapping into the resources of heaven. We tap into it through our faith, which is powered through prayer. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, as the scripture says, faith combines, come by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. But in order to tap into those things that God gives you, we tap into it through prayer. Every time we read in the scriptures in the New Testament, it talks about how Jesus would steal away and, and he'll be up early in the morning praying. Uh, he'd leave everybody to the side and he would go and pray in the Garden of Gethsemane. When Jesus was weak, he began to do what? He began to pray. He's tapping into the resources of heaven here on earth through prayer. Folks, what am I saying? You got to have a prayer life. There is just no way. It is, such, it is so essential in a Christian's life to have a prayer life. Amen. It is the way we talk to God. It is like an umbilical cord that's attached to God and we are receiving the nutrients of God in our spirit man so that we can handle the attacks against our, our against ourselves uh, uh, in the natural. We stand fortified in the spirit. Amen. So when things begin and, and things is not meant to bring down your natural man it's meant to bring down your spirit man. Once you can, once you can, your spirit man begins to take down, then your, your, your natural man is got. So nevertheless, you want to make sure you have a prayer life. Uh, uh, because we look at this as spiritual warfare, email us, go to our website, click on the prayer request tab, fill out your confidential information. My wife and I receive that. We'll read through it, make sure it lines up with the word of God and take it to the prayer closet uh, immediately. Amen. And oftentimes or not, we believe that God gives us um, um, scriptures. Uh, we I, I kind of look at it as an alcohol swab. When you go to the doctor, go to the uh, to, to your hospital, or something, and when they get ready to give you a shot because of whatever's going on in your natural man, they take an alcohol swab and wipe that area down before they administer uh, uh, the treatment, if you will. Well, I believe that God does the same thing when he gives us scriptures. It's, it's, it's somewhat of the alcohol swab before he does what he's about to do. Um, don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed to ask us for prayer. We are all here to pray one for another. And while we're on the topic of prayer, and I'm about to close out the protocol so we can get right into the lesson. But while we're on the topic of prayer, uh, folks, go to our website and look for the prayer list. And look at those names that are on the prayer list. Pray for those people that are on the prayer list. Those are your brothers and sisters. Amen. Be, it'll behoove yourself to go to that website and go to our website again. Click on the prayer prayer uh, prayer list um, and, and pray for those your brothers and sisters that are on there. Whatever they may be going through, just ask God. You know, if whatever they've been seeking God for. Those things that line up with his will, that, that God would remove them uh, uh, from the bondage of, of sin or, or that he would give them power, uh, you know, to mortify the deeds of the flesh. Amen. Uh, that, that God would loose them from addictions. That God would heal them from depression. Amen. Uh, whatever you're being led to pray for concerning those people or to pray about concerning your brothers and sisters that are on the prayer list. Folks, prayer works. I, I, I've got so many stories, but I'm here to teach right now. So, but uh, prayer works. Um, last but not least, uh, first of all, let me thank our, our new subscribers. Those of you that, that find our videos on YouTube. Uh, we welcome you to our Bible studies. And those of you that have been coming to our website particularly uh, uh, to be taught. Uh, thank you for continuing to be with us. Uh, we want to go through our United Body, of, United Body of Christ Declaration of Purpose, and then we'll go right into our Bible studies. Um, I've been reading this as we go through our Bible studies, and, and this is kind of what our, our uh, identity is, if you will. Amen. Uh, I am the righteousness of God, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people created by God, and his word 
because I was created in the image and the likeness of God and are now conformed to the image of his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, I will say what I do and do what I say. All my steps in this Christian walk will be devoted to excellence in loving all my brethren, those known and unknown, serving the will of God just as is done in heaven, and having all faith in God, believing God for all things, written and petitioned. Because I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me, I will do the two things that are known to do. I will love the Lord our God with all my heart, in word and in deed. And I will love thy neighbor just as I love myself. I will let God assign me to rest just as he assigned me to first. Amen? Amen. Uh, again, folks, looking forward to this Bible study. Uh, I believe that God is the chef. The Holy Spirit is the one that has organized the function. What's being served is the bread of God, which is the word of God, that being the Lord Jesus Christ. I am nothing but the server. Amen. Uh, I prayed over this meal. This is the spread of the table. I prayed over it. Uh, I believe that this is an excellent word of truth and of power and of simplicity. Uh, I believe that God will bestow his wisdom upon the, the, the listener, the hearer of his holy word. And I believe lives will be changed as you are enlightened with God's truth according to that which you receive from this spread. Amen. To God be the glory. Now, again, Leviticus 5th chapter, beginning at verse 1, uh, 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 we covered before uh, uh, a few things concerning uh, uh, the, the, uh, the offerings, if you will, of the Lord, uh, what, what he expects. And, and a lot, I believe in our last recording, we talked about um, the different offerings. The, uh, uh, you know, it's, you look at the offerings as part of your worship with God. Like today, we look at tithes and offerings. Uh, that we give, you know, but God wants much more than your money. As a matter of fact, <laughs> to be honest with you, nowadays, let me tell you something. Uh, scriptures tells us that God desires obedience before sacrifice. Amen. So he prefers in, in your walk with God, he prefers to have you being obedient. Don't pay your way into heaven through your tithes and offerings, because just as you're paying your way, he might be rejecting the money that you're giving because you're not lining up with his word and his will. Amen. So we're seeing uh, some of the things as we go through Leviticus here. We're seeing the expectation that God has concerning the peculiar people, which is his children, Israel. Amen. So he's guiding and instructing them on, on uh, their way of, of giving their offerings to him. You know, basically he's saying, I won't reject your offering if it's done according to this precept. Amen. So let's look at what the fifth chapter of Leviticus says. He says, if a soul sin, if a person sins and you hear a charge that's being laid out, that's what the scripture says. You hear the voice of swearing. You hear a charge that's being laid out and you are a witness uh, to whether you've seen it or not. If he do not utter it, then he shall bear his iniquity. So again, if you hear a charge that's being laid out and, and you're a witness to to whatever's whatever's being said you are a witness to whatever the charge is but you keep your peace and you don't say yay or nay concerning what what is what's what's being charged at against someone you're a witness to it then you, the, the scriptures call you guilty it says that uh, you shall bear the iniquity or you shall bear the responsibility of that charge that's being laid out amen uh, or the guilt another way to look at it you should bear bear the guilt of it amen uh, going on here uh, verse 2 
if a person touch any unclean thing with and it begins to define at least to some regards of what unclean is here verse 2 if a if a person touch any unclean thing whether it be a carcass of an unclean beast and the beast is wild animal here uh, whether it be the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of unclean cattle uh, such as that in your herd if you will or the carcass of an unclean creeping things insects uh, swarms you know whatever insects crickets or whatever if it be hidden from him he also shall be unclean or uh, the word unclean here could be looked at as defiled he shall be defiled and guilty so basically it's self-explanatory as the scripture is saying if you're wandering in the woods somewhere and you come against a damn animal and maybe you did your best to try to avoid the path and you actually when you was trying to step over it you may have bumped into it scripture says that you're defiled uh, you're considered unclean and because you're considered unclean there's a guilt to that um, uh, and therefore you must uh, you got to go and, and get yourself together amen and it gives the remedy <laughs> for the defilement if you will it even goes on to say and when you talk about carcass obviously we're talking about dead animals and dead insects anybody that touches at least what the scripture is defi defining as unclean that being the the dead insect or the dead animal uh, that makes you that makes your your tabernacle your temple defiled and 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 you must and you're guilty of the defilement of your temple or your tabernacle if you will amen uh, going on with this uh, if he touches an unclean man uh, the uncleanness rather of a man whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled withal and if it be hid from him, when he knoweth of it, uh, then he shall be found guilty. So, uh, maybe we can go to Numbers real quick. Let's go to Numbers 19 and 11 to see at least one example of the uncleanness of men. So, hold your places right there. Go with me real quick to Numbers. And uh, we'll define at least or give an example at least of... Um, what the scriptures is looking at as far as at least one example of uncleanness amen numbers uh chapter 19 verse 11 or at least beginning at verse 11 it says he that touches the dead body of any man shall be defiled or unclean for seven days so just as the scripture gave us the uh, um the 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 example of the uncleanness as far as defining the touching of a dead animal one aspect of touching in the uncleanness of man is if you come across a cadaver or you know a dead body or whatever and you touch that you're unclean for seven days amen uh going on with verse 12 here in numbers 19 it says he shall purify himself uh with it on the he shall purify himself uh with it on the third day and on the seventh day he shall be clean but if he purify himself, if he purify not himself on the third day, then the seventh day he shall not be clean. Whosoever touches the dead body of any man that is dead and purifieth not himself defileth the tabernacle of the Lord. Uh, and that soul or that person shall be cut off from Israel because the water of separation was not sprinkled upon him. Uh, he shall be unclean. His uncleanness is yet upon him so it's defining the purification process of a person being unclean so verse 14 this is the law when a man dieth in a tent all that come into the tent and all that is in the tent shall be unclean for seven days so if somebody is dead within the tent and the people gather within the tent then all those people that is within the tent where the dead person is uh, they're all unclean and one of the ways that we look at this that God is saying that that you're unclean one of the ways that we look at it is quite simple God is the God of the living not the God of the dead so those things a living person touching something dead gets defiled because God is the God of the living amen um, verse 15 and every open vessel which has no covering bound upon it is unclean and and uh, whosoever touches one that is slain with the sword in an open field 
or a dead body or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean. So these are different examples of, of man's uncleanness that, uh, that Leviticus is talking about. So we can go back to Leviticus there. So going back to Leviticus, the third chapter or third verse in chapter five, let's reread that. It says, or if he touches the uncleanness of a man, whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled withal, uh, it, and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it, then shall he be guilty. So if you didn't know that being in a tent, uh, coming into a tent where a person uh, lay dead, if you didn't know that 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 made you unclean, once you came in to the knowledge of it, then you were found guilty. You were found guilty, but you just needed to come into the knowledge of your guilt, if is what the scripture is saying. Amen. Uh, verse four: Or if a soul swear, pronouncing with his lips to do evil or to do good, whatsoever it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath and it be hid from him when he knoweth of it then shall it be guilty then shall he be guilty in one of these so a person that a person that 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 swears or the scripture says make an oath a person that does this when they casually do it uh it says if you just let words fly out of your mouth you know, and the words that flew out of your mouth was that you just made an oath and you wasn't really just, you just talking to be talking, if you will. But when you realize that you've made an oath, then you're held accountable for what you said. Amen. And that, that, that's a sin. That, that, that has to be atoned for. Now, this is why Jesus tells us, don't, don't even, <laughs> don't even make an oath. Don't even make any, you know, don't swear by nothing. You know, you got people nowadays that say, I swear, but I swear on my children's life or I swear on my mother's life. The Lord forbids us to be swearing at all. Hold your places right there and let's look into this just a little bit. Go with me real quick. Uh, let's go to Matthew 5 and 33 Matthew 5 and 33 uh, this is what Jesus has to say about it Matthew 5 and 33 watch this he says again you have heard that it had been said by them of the old time thou should not forswear uh, in this case thou thou should not swear uh, thou should not make an oath in this case um, thou should not lie in the oath that you that's another way to look at it uh, that you shouldn't lie in the oath that you're taking here. Um, you know, swear falsely. Uh, but here's what it says here. Thou should not swear falsely thyself, but shall perform unto uh, the Lord thine oaths, thine oaths, or thy, thy, your vows to God. So, if you understand this scripture here, it's saying that the sin is not making a vow unto the Lord it's allowing your lips to be loose. Uh, uh, when we read in here in Leviticus, when you read what's going on in Matthew 33 and then compare it to Leviticus, it seems that what, what God is saying in Leviticus is if you're loose, if your lips are loose and you begin to just make a, a oath or a vow out of loose lips, not really meaning it, uh, then you then you got a problem you know you're guilty of, of committing a sin against God but watch let's continue with Matthew 5 and 33 and see ultimately what Jesus is saying here uh, so let's reread it again you have heard that has been said and and you know by them of the old time thou should not swear falsely forswear thyself but thou shall perform unto the Lord thy oath. so whatever you promise God whatever you swear to God that which you should do but Jesus goes on to say here in verse 34 but I swear unto you swear not at all neither by heaven neither neither by heaven for it is God's throne he goes on to say in 35 nor by the earth for it is the Lord's footstool it's God's footstool heaven is God's throne and the earth is God's footstool neither by Jerusalem for it is the city of the great king he goes on to say in 36, neither shalt thou swear by thine head because thou cannot make one hair white or black. So, you know, nowadays the equivalent to this is when we say I swear by my kids. You know, I swear by it. I swear by my house or whatever. You don't have the you, you don't have the 
the power to make these things that you're swearing by. So it's best for you not to swear at all. He goes on to say, let your communications in verse 37 be yea, yea, or nay, nay. For whatever is more than these cometh of evil. The devil will take this. Jesus says, it's best for you to just keep it simple. You know, let your conversations be yea, yea, or nay, nay. Just keep it simple. You don't need to swear. You don't need to swear by this or swear by that to try to convince people. Let your conversations be real simple. Yay, yay, or nay, nay. He said, because anything more than you trying to prove or persuade to other people, anything more than, a, than, a, than, than the simplicity of conversation, if you have to come by a swearing, then the devil uses that to, to, to bring evil out of it. Sin comes from that. Amen. So that's what Jesus has to say about it. Go with me real quick to, to the book of James, uh, verse 5 and 12. James, verse 5 and 12. Real quick. So, again, folks, you don't have to tell people, you know, as you're trying to make your point, you begin to swear. You don't have to do that. You know, I, I swear by my kids that, no, nah, no, nah, people, if people, first of all, if people ain't believing you, there might be a reason. Maybe you used to lying, so it's better to just stop, <laughs> to quit while you ahead. Amen. Don't lay a charge up by swearing just to try to persuade people. And then here's something else for you to know. People that don't believe you, whether you're telling the truth, believing that you're telling the truth, people that don't really like you, or people that don't really get into your truths, there is nothing that you're going to do to convince them anyway to buy into what you're saying. E even if you prove that what you're saying is true, there's they won't they're still going to find a way to to be to at least for themselves to be convinced of your lies in, in something else. You may be truthful right here, but overall, they're still going to look at you negatively. So why risk a, a, a sinful charge by trying to persuade the very people that you're not going to convince of your righteousness? Do you understand what I'm trying to say? If you got to go and try to swear to people that, that you're being honest or that you're being truthful, you know, in what you're saying, then they're not going to be convinced about you anyway. That's why you're going to extra mile to try to persuade them in what you're saying. They're still not going to be convinced. You may be truthful in this area, but in another area, they're, they're going to look at you differently anyway. So why try to go the extra mile? But look at what James 5 and 12 says. James 5 and 12. But above all things, my brethren, he says, above all things, swear not. Neither by heaven, neither by earth, neither by any other oath. But let your let your yeas be yea, let your nays nay, lest ye fall into what condemnation or, or or you know or conviction, you know what have you. But um, that's you know damnation, if you will. You know, the, you give the, the give the enemy an opportunity to 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 get on up in there. And then, like I said, God's got an issue with it anyway. So that's that's pretty good. You know, just getting some understanding about trying to you know, and a lot of times people just don't buy into your credibility, and so you'll try to persuade them through swearing. So uh, just wanted to look at that real quick. So. Obviously, we see here in verse four, if a person swear pronouncing with his lips, loose lips to do evil, to do good, whatso it be that a man shall pronounce with an oath, if it be hid from him, uh, if you didn't realize you said it, and then once you come into the understanding that you said it, uh, then you're found guilty. We can look at one example. I actually had a, a kind of a, a mild example here, but I think I gave you. Uh, you know, one about nowadays how people swear. But if you look, uh, go with me in the book of Acts and, and all in the New Testament, you will hear people it don't have to be. Uh, I mean, in the Old Testament, uh, let God do unto me and more so uh, and more also if by the morning time I don't do this to so and so. Uh, there be an example there. But Acts 23 and 12 is something that I wrote down for us here uh, real quick. Acts 23 and 12 uh, and when it was and when it was day certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul 
and they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy so you know people making these oaths we're not going and when we won't eat or drink until paul is dead and it was a long time before paul was dead you know before paul was killed during the time that they were saying these things so you kind of wonder <laughs> What what happened in that fast that they was doing? Did they actually break down and get something to eat? You know, otherwise, if if, <laughs> if you know, you, you charge with these things. One of the things that the scripture tells us is that that we have to give an account for every idle word. We will have to give an account. This is what Jesus tells us. We have to give an account for every idle word. Amen. Words are important to God. He framed the earth, the planet, the heavens, with, with his word, the Lord Jesus Christ, God spoke it and it was performed. So you don't waste words on lies. Do you understand what I'm saying? You don't waste words on oaths, false promise, false promises and lies. Words are powerful. Amen. You don't turn your words over to the devil through lies. Amen. So obviously we see repercussions here verse 5 it says and it shall be that when he be guilty of one of these things that he shall confess that he have sinned in this in that thing so whenever you come in to finding out what it was that you done wrong whether you touch something that was unclean or whether you 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 let your lips loosely speak of oaths or false promises once you discover that you've done wrong then you have to come and confess your sin that's no different than what we're told in the New Testament, uh, especially in the book of John, uh, 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 John 1, uh, 1 John, uh, first chapter, verse 9. It says, uh, uh, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Amen. But what do you have to do? You have to confess. There is power in those things that we say. Do you understand what I'm saying? And this is why the scripture says that you have to confess uh, once you realize that you've done wrong, confess what you've done wrong so that you can be healed. Amen. Now, there's a process that God lays out for atonement, uh, but it all starts with your confession. Uh, going on here in verse 6, And he shall bring uh, his trespass offering unto the Lord for a sin which he had sinned. A female of the flock, a lamb or a, or, or a kid of the goat or young goat is what it's saying, uh, for a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. And if he be not able to bring a lamb, if he can, if, if the person that have sinned, if they can't afford the lamb, uh, then they shall bring in verse seven for his trespass, which he have committed, two doves, two turtle doves, uh, or two young pigeons, um, unto the Lord, uh, one for a sin offering and the other for the burnt offering. Amen? Now, again, God looks at, he's, he's looking at, okay, you may not have a lamb. You know, because what did Jesus say? We'll always have the poor among us. So, maybe God didn't give one person the herd, like, you know, like he gave somebody else. But they still had an opportunity to walk with God because you don't walk with God based on what you got in your pocket. You walk with God based on what you got in your heart. So God didn't leave somebody without sacrifice. In this case, he says, okay, you may not have the lamb to give, but I'll, I'll tell you what, go catch, go get two doves or go get two, uh, go get two pigeons. That'd be good enough for me. Amen. Um, going on with this until the Lord, uh, you offer these things unto the Lord as a sin offering and says, and the other four burnt offering. Now let's stop right there. <coughs> This is first you you're confessing what you've done wrong and then you're willing to reconcile what you've done wrong by making an offering. What is the, the scriptures calls this bringing forth fruits worthy of repentance. It's it's the difference when when you do receive here's one thing you're not breaking the rules of God first. You're breaking God's heart. Amen. And so when you realize what you've done wrong because you know that God, you've disappointed God in a sense. You, you broke his heart. When you come into to that what you've done, then 
It's, this is the way you say, I'm sorry to God. And you bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. You're coming and saying, Lord, I'm sorry. I messed up. I've, I've done this thing. And I know that that hurt you as I, as I did that. I just realized what I did wrong. And even though I didn't know that I was doing it at the time, the, the fact that I've come into the knowledge that I've done this, I'm embarrassed. I should have known better. And I'm embarrassed. And I'm sorry because I know how this has made you feel. I want to give this to let you know how sorry I am. That's fruits worthy of repentance. Nowadays, people mess up. Well, I believe God knew what I was going to do before I did it anyway, so I'm good. <laughs> that's, not, that's, that's not fruits worthy of repentance. That's, you broke his heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's not fruits worthy of repentance. Let me tell you something. This is a bad example, and I'm probably going to get a few emails. But if you go upside somebody's head and you say, I'm sorry, then go upside their head again, what good is your sorry when you keep going back and doing the same thing? Somebody say, I'm sorry, and they'll go buy you some flowers after they done did something wrong to you. What good is the flowers if they going right back the next day and doing it again, what, they going to buy you a bigger bouquet? <laughs> they do something else wrong, they going to get you a bigger bouquet? What God wants is the conviction within you. Because the conviction comes by the way of the spirit in a sense. You're convicted in your heart. Then this is not protocol to you. This is like, this is the least I can do because I messed up. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's wanting you to feel what you've done wrong. He's wanting you to feel bad because you've done this thing. But if you don't feel bad, if there's some pride and arrogance about, uh, he knew what I was going to do before I'm doing so him and I, we cool. He, we got this understanding. No, you don't. <laughs> I got a verse here. Um. Uh, let's just move on. I th I think you got the I th I think you got the right idea. It's it's you know in in, in Matthew uh, John the Baptist he was he was baptizing and he seen the Pharisees and it's like y'all the ones that need to come on over here and get some of this baptism. He was like, didn't haven't you been warned about these days and times that we're in? And he was like, uh, and say not to you. He says, you need to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. And say not within yourselves, we have Abraham as, a, as our father. Because let me tell you what God, let me tell you what how God looks at that. This is what John the Baptist was telling the Pharisees. He was like, y'all are the ones that need to repent for the things that y'all have been doing. He says, you need to bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. And he was like, don't get to the point and say out of pride that you got Abraham as your father. So God is going to look over everything that you did, you know, because he John goes on to say that God will mess around and turn these stones. <laughs> he'll, he'll, he'll end up using these stones instead of you. Uh, and that's today when people have this arrogance, they're proud when they mess up. They was like, you don't know the God that I know. You know, uh, nah, you're right about that <laughs> because me and you might be serving two different gods because the God that I know would have a problem with that whole thing. And you get when you start walking with God, you're going to start realizing that. And those of you that are already walking with them, you'll be able to am amen me. It's more than breaking his laws. First and foremost, you start to realize that you're breaking his heart. Do you understand that you're breaking his heart? Um, and, and, and when that happens, then you come into the understanding of the knowledge of the law. But first and foremost, you, you're like, man, I can't, I'd be embarrassed when I, when, when I do something wrong and, and folks, I ain't the only one that messed up, you know, I know, you know, <laughs> some of you, you, you mess up too, but when you mess up and once you come into the understanding that you messed up. What you're doing is coming to the understanding of how God may be looking at you. And you drop the ball. The, the one good thing about this thing is that even though we feel discouraged because we may have let God down, 
it's not enough to separate us from his love. And so therefore, we don't have to walk away because there is no conviction, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. So once you realize you let God down, you don't give up. You bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. In this case, you don't offer your tithes and offering to make up for what you did. In this case, you let them know, you confess your sins. You say, God, I messed up. This is what I did. And let me tell you something. I'm sorry because I know that I'm better than this. And I know that if I was walking with you a, a lot closer and not trying to do what I want to do, this would not have happened, God. So not only am I, not only am I asking you to accept my apologies, but I'm also asking you for the awareness and the strength to never repeat this sin again, God. That's bringing forth fruits worthy of repentance. What you're bringing is what's in your heart, not what's in your hand. Your hand is only accommodating what's in your heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when, when you realize that I've messed up, I don't care if it's adultery. I don't care if it's drugs, if it's fornication. If you are, once you come into this conviction, you know that you broke God's heart. Amen. So let's let's go on with this uh, verse uh, verse eight. So God looks at the fact that you don't have you know maybe you're not financially able to bring forth the 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 lamb as he required, but he still you know those those that weren't financially uh, uh, sustained like someone else was, God still made a way for them to be able to offer fruits of fruits worthy of repentance, if you will. Uh, verse eight, um, and he shall bring to the priest who shall offer that which is for the sin offering first. And then he's going to take the head off of the neck of the turtle dove or the pigeon. Uh, but he shall divide it, uh, but shall not divide it apart. That word asunder is apart. Uh, and he shall sprinkle the blood of the sin offering upon the side of the altar. And the rest of the blood shall be wrung out on the bottom of the altar, and it is the sin offering. And he shall offer of the second for a burnt offering, according to the according to the manner, according to the prescribed manner. It says, And the priest shall make an atonement for him for the sin which he hath sinned, and it shall be forgiven him. But if he doesn't, but if he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sin, he that sin shall bring forth the offering, which is the tenth part of an ephah of fine, fine flour. That tenth part kind of translate to like two quarts, two quarts uh, of, of a fine flour, two quarts, quarts. Um, that's the sin offering. He says he, they are to put no oil upon it, neither put any incense or frankincense on it. It is the sin offering. Then they shall put, they shall bring it into the priest, uh, bring it, bring it to the priest rather, and the priest shall take his handful of it, even of the memorial, that portion of it that's God. He's going to take that from it, that that portion that belongs to God, and he's going to burn it on the altar according to the offering made by fire unto the Lord. For it's a sin offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him uh, concerning the sin which he had sinned in one of these. And it shall be forgiven him. And the remainder or the remnant shall be the priest as a grain offering, if you will. So that will be the priest portion. So that's covering uh, the uncleanness by touching uh, any animals or any or, or touching anything. That was uh, the uncleanness of the man and, and or the loose lips making these oaths, oaths or vows, if you will. Amen. So that's the that's the remedy for once you come into the understanding. There's the atonement, the channel of the atonement, if you will, the pathway of it. Verse 14. And the Lord spoke unto Moses or spake unto Moses, saying, if a soul commit a trespass. A sin through ignorance in the holy thing of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish of the flocks, 
uh, with thine estimation by the shekels of silver. So, uh, well, let me read this whole verse and then we'll get into the to the trespass, what that is, and then the this the the uh, the value of it, the estimation or the appraisal of 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 this of that which he's bringing. Um, so he's going to bring the estimation or the appraisal by the shekel of silver uh, after the shekel of the sanctuary for a trespass offering. Now, a trespass offering, uh, in this case, this trespass offering is talking about the holy things of the Lord. And it is regarding the invading or disregarding of a, of a person's property rights, if you will. Uh, so it's the violation of... Of, of whatever a person has, it is the violation of that particular person's property. That's considered the trespass. Amen? Uh, so in this case, God says the holy thing. Watch this. If a soul committed, if a person commits a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy thing, the holy thing of the Lord. So that could be the tithe. That could be the offering or any property that was dedicated to God. If a person uh, uh, violates in any in, in to any regard those things that were of God, that's a trespass. Um, uh, if you think about uh, signs that are up in people's yard that says no trespassing, you know, uh, no coming up on a property. Uh, you know, anything that you're doing concerning, in, in the, at least concerning the holy thing here, anything that's concerning God's particular property, uh, then then that that's a violation and there's a particular protocol to have atonement concerning those things of God. And notice how it goes on to say here that the way, the way you do it, um, you are to offer a lamb without blemish out of the flocks uh, and with thy estimation... That's the, whatever you offer, uh, uh, it, it has to be equivalent to the, the valued price, which is within the shekel. And I think it's like two shekels of silver, something, something to that extent. That which you offer has to be equivalent uh, uh, in, in, in its worth to whatever the, the shekel price is, whatever the shekel price, and I think it was like two shekels of silver. That's the best way I can explain it, amen? It, it has to do with, with the appraisal worth of it, and it needs to be at least a particular worth according to the standard of the shekel of, the, of, the, of that, the growing rate, if you will, or the standard of the shekel concerning the, according to the sanctuary. Uh, but going on to this, uh, verse 16, he shall make amends for the harm that he has done in the holy thing. Um, and he shall add the fifth part thereunto and give it unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him uh, with the ram of the trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. So whatever he did against God's holy thing, not only is he to atone for it, but there's there's an interest uh, interest penalty attached to it, so he's he's uh, charged with at least uh, a, a fifth portion of it that he has to give on top of that which he's already giving, if you will, uh, as as it says here, and he shall add the fifth part thereunto and give it to the priest. Uh, so whatever is the, the estimated cost or whatever it is uh, uh, that's considered the holy thing, he has to match that value at least a fifth part of it. He, he gives according to the, he gives the lamb, which is according to the, 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 the shekel of the sanctuary, if you will. But then he has to also add uh, the fifth part. To, it's, it's like an interest charge, if you will. Amen. Uh, and then it'll be, give, it'll be forgiven him. Verse 17, And if a soul sin and commit any of these things which are forbidden to be done by the commandments of the Lord, though he did, though he wist, wist it not, though he didn't have any knowledge of it at the time, yet is he guilty and shall bear his iniquity or shall be charged with the iniquity, if you will. Verse 18, And he shall bring a ram without blemish out of the flock, 
uh, with thy estimation, with the appraisal costs. Um, and, and one would have to assume, at least right here, that what if you didn't have a ram? Whatever the cost was within the, the sanctuary, say that the sanctuary says that that ram that you got, that the, the going rate of, of a lamb without blemish may be two shekels. So maybe you didn't have a ram, but bring forth two shekels. One would have to assume that that would be the appraisal. That's why you would have an appraisal or, or an estimation to it. Because maybe you can easily atone for it by giving. Because you're talking about the holy thing of God. Maybe you can atone for it by not only giving the, 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 if the, if the cost of the sanctuary cost at the, sign, at the time was two shekels of silver. Not only do you give the two shekels of silver, but whatever the, the violation was, you would give the fifth part of that according to the principle. You would give the fifth part of that, which would be the interest. The interest of, of uh, the interest of what uh, uh, the violation was, the cost of the violation itself. Amen. Uh, verse 18, and he shall bring a ram without blemish out of the flock with thine estimation for a trespass offering unto the priest. And the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning the ignorance wherein he erred, erred if, if you will, and did not know it or wist it not and shall be forgiven him. It is a trespass offering and it's and has certainly trespassed against the Lord. So that covers that trespass concerning the holy things of God. Now, there is also a trespass concerning your neighbor's property. Remember, we define this trespass as somebody being in violation, somewhat uh, invading or disregarding the property rights of another person. Yeah, amen. So, so that's the way to define it. The, I, and then, to be honest with you, the trespass offering was actually called the guilt offering. Amen. The guilt offering, um, and, and that's what it was about. Uh, those things that you've done. Now, now, as we get into this chapter six, it, it talks. It starts off talking about the trespass offering. It's not mentioning uh, ignorance here. This particular trespass. Or, or guilt offering here uh, is considered to be the deception of someone's actions that you're doing to your neighbor. You're supposed to love your neighbor as yourself, right? So you're not going to try to deceive yourself. Well, neither should you deceive your neighbor. And because you're doing some things to your neighbor, that's a trespass. You're, in, you're found in violation of them or their property. In turn, you're being in violation of God because whatever you're doing to them, you are doing to God himself. Amen. So there is the trespass concerning the holy things of God, which are those things that were dedicated to God, given to him, whether it's property or tithes and offering. Those are the holy. Those are examples of the holy things of God. But then there is the trespass of those things that were committed against your neighbor. And that's what uh, uh, chapter six is going to at least start off talking about. Amen. So let's go on and get into chapter six and uh, we'll take it to uh, Leviticus six and one. And the Lord spake unto Moses saying, if a soul sin and commit a trespass against the Lord and he lied unto his neighbor in that which was delivered for him to keep or in fellowship or in a thing taken away by violence or an oath. This or or not an oath or have deceived his neighbor or have found that which was lost and lieth concerning it and sweared falsely in any of all these things do a man sin therein and and so what it's saying is if you and your neighbor had an understanding that you would hold some personal property of theirs uh you know, and, and your neighbor ask you about it and you send up here lying. I don't know what happened to it. Or when they bring you up on charges, you lie to the magistrate saying they never gave me nothing. Uh, he said, if a soul sin and commit this trespass, you're doing it against God. He goes on. To, it goes on to say that if they gave you something for you to keep for safe, keep it for them uh, and, and you just took it for yourself. Uh, or in the thing taken away by violence, you robbed them. You robbed your neighbor of it. You took it by force. You robbed them or have deceived your neighbor. You conned them into taking their stuff. 
or have found that which was lost and lie concerning it. So you, so you didn't steal it. They lost it. You found it. They asked you if you seen it. You said no. Um, it says, in any of these that a man doeth sinning therein, then, then it shall be because he have sinned and is guilty that he shall restore or return uh, that which was taken violently away or the thing which he hath deceitfully gotten or that which, which was delivered to him for safekeeping. You know, they gave it to you for safekeeping or the lost thing which was found. Or all that, or all that about which he had sworn falsely, he shall even restore it in the principle. So, restoring it in the principle is whatever condition that it was given to you, whatever condition that it was lost, whatever condition uh, um, um, that it was given to you to have or or to store up. That original condition that it was given to you. It should be in its. It should be in that state. That is the principle. It should be within that particular valued state. It shouldn't be because you got to give it back. You gonna tear it up. Then I'll give. I tear it up after that. You know. You. I gotta give it back to you. Well, I'm gonna make sure it don't work again. Then I'll give it back. Well, no. God. God spoke against that. He says it shall even be returned, restored, returned in the principle, and shall add the fifth part more thereto and give it unto whom it belongeth to that appertaineth is belongeth to in the day of the trespass offering so the day that you give your trespass offering you're also to reconcile the difference with your neighbor amen so what the scripture say um scripture talks about bless you holy ghost uh, the scripture talks about in Matthew, I think Jesus was talking in, in Matthew, that if you got to ought with your brother to, before you offer, it says, lay your, lay your gift off the altar and then go reconcile with your brother. And once you reconcile with your brother, then come back and make your offerings with God. Well, this is kind of the same sense that the day that you give your trespass offer, you restore to your brother that which you owe them first with interest. Then you come back and, and offer your what you what you what was owed to God concerning your guilt. Now, this there is no um at least what, what we read before, it was those things that you were ignorant in. But I'm here to tell you that if you're deceiving, there ain't no ignorance to it. That you too smart for your own good on this one. But this also speaks of the mercies of God, because if you deceive your neighbor and God would still allow you to to not only all, you know, not only restore it unto them, but to come back and make your offering to him. He's forgiving you because there can't be any ignorance here when you sitting on out deceiving somebody and sitting here lying. You're lying because you do know better. That's why you're lying. You're trying to cover your tracks because you know better. Amen. And so the so this also speaks about the mercies of God uh, that he will allow you to offer to 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 offer uh, uh, to to be reconciled for, you know, that that you don't get any curses upon your life. Uh, so that we I find that to be pretty, pretty benevolent of God, if you will. Uh, he's awesome. Uh, going on with this. Um, verse five. Or all that, actually we read that, verse 6. Uh, and he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, a ram without blemish out of the flock with thine estimation, uh, with the appraisal uh, offering of it, or the, 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 the appraised value of it, if you will. We, we've already covered it. Again, one would have to believe that whatever the, the rate was for the... For the um, uh, whatever the rate was for the for the uh, uh, the the ram, uh, one would actually have to believe that that whatever the whatever the sanctuary deemed the cost was for the you should make sure that it is of that particular value, amen. Or or maybe you can give the two shekels instead of the ram, uh, whatever you know whatever you get from this you know go with it but nevertheless verse 6 he shall bring the trespass offering unto the lord a ram without blemish out of the flock uh, with thine estimation for the trespass offering unto the priest 
and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord, and it shall be forgiven him for any of all that he hath done in the trespassing therein. Amen. So again, that also this this particular ver this particular chapter here in verse six again also speaks of the mercies of God, because there is no ignorance in this. If you're lying, again, I, I submit to you, you're lying because you do know better. That's why you're lying. Amen. Uh, verse 8 in, in chapter 6 here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying that this is the law of the burnt offering. Now he begins here to define the burnt offering. We've seen the burnt offering actually come into play back here, and I believe in the first chapter of Leviticus. So as we're here in, 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 in uh, chapter 6, verse 8, uh, at least in verse 9, rather, he begins to define the birth offering. And then watch what he says here concerning it. It is a burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning. Uh, and the fire of the altar shall be burning on it. So, again, it is a burnt offering uh, uh, because of the burning upon the altar all night long. So that flame is never extinguished. Amen. It is always burning. So when you put your, when you put, when the burnt offering is put upon the altar of, of the burning offer, then it, it, it's, it's burnt told to a crisp, if you will. It's totally burnt. And such is the case with the, with the burnt offering itself. It burns all night long. Amen. Uh, verse 10. And the priest shall put on it his and the priest shall put on his linen garments and his linen breeches or his underclothes, and he shall put upon his flesh, uh, he shall put upon his flesh and take up the ashes which the fire has consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and shall put them beside the altar. Uh, shall put them beside the altar, and he shall put off the garments, and put on the garments, uh, put off, the, I'm sorry, folks, let me reread verse 10 here, then we'll go back in 11. And the priest shall put on his linen garments, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his, his flesh, and take up the ashes which the fire has consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar, and he shall put off his garments, and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes outside that word without is outside outside the camp to a clean place so when he's ministering inside uh, the uh, the tabernacle of congregations if you will when he's ministering inside there he has a particular linen clothes on with the linen bre uh, breeches of uh, the undergarments if you will but when it's time for him to grab the ashes uh, those things that are left uh, after the 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 offering has been consumed by fire, the ashes that are left that are down on the side of the altar, he has to take that, he's changed his clothes, take it outside to a place outside the camp, if you will, outside the camp totally, a spot that's designated as a clean place, discard the stuff there, discard the ashes and stuff there, uh, and then come back into the the camp, and then come back into the the the, the temple, the uh, the the, the uh, congregation, um, the tent of meetings, if you will. Come back there, change your clothes, put put back on your linen garments, if you will. So there's the different clothing for taking that stuff outside, and then outside the camp, and then coming back in and putting back on the 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 minister's uh, uh, garments, if you will. Amen. Um, in the verse 12, and a fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. And the fire shall ever be burning upon the altar, and it shall never go out. This is the burnt offering. And this is the law of the grain offering, the meat offering. That's the grain offering. The sons of Aaron. This and concern. So basically the scripture is saying concerning the protocol for the grain offering. This is what I expect. We just got done reading the protocol for the burnt offering. Here is the protocol for the grain offering. He goes on the he goes on to say here uh, in verse 14. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord before the altar, and he shall take of it his handful 
of the flour of the grain offering and of the oil thereof and of all the incense or frankincense which is upon the meat offering or the grain offering and shall burn it upon the altar for its sweet aroma even the memorial of it unto the Lord or the portions of it that he's going to give he gives that to the Lord that's the part that he's going to burn on the altar Verse 16, the remainder or the remnant thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with unleavened bread, no yeast, shall it be eaten in the holy place. In the court of the tabernacle of congregations shall they eat it, and it shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it unto them for their portions or for their share, which is talking about Aaron and his sons, of my offerings made by fire. It is very holy. That word most holy is very holy as it is the sin offering as the trespass and as the trespass offering. So it applies to the sin offering and it applies to the trespass offering. Amen. All the males, all the males among the children of Aaron shall eat of it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Everyone that touches them uh, uh, must be holy, if you will. Amen. So only the priests are allowed to, to consume the portions of this. And it's a perpetual, a continual decree that God is setting in place. And only the priests are, that can be holy can, can have access to the remnants that's left of the offerings, if you will, which is Aaron and his sons. Amen. And the Lord spake unto Moses in verse 19, saying, This is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which they shall offer unto the Lord in the day when he is appointed or ordained, if you will. Uh, anointed, he says. The tenth part of the ephah of fine flour. And again, that's two quarts, if you will, two quarts. Uh, two quarts of fine flour, or the you know your best flour, which is the grain offering, and it's perpetual, it's continual. Uh, half of it in the morning and half of it thereof at night. And it should be cooked on a griddle and it should be mixed with oil. Uh, and when it is baked, thou shalt bring it in and the baked pieces of the meat offering or the grain offering shall thou offer uh, for a sweet aroma unto the Lord. So it says you're going to, when you uh, give this for Aaron and his sons, the day that they are anointed or ordained, they shall offer unto the Lord um, th this tenth part of the ephah of flour, which is two quarts of, of fine flour, um, for a grain offering, uh, which is a perpetual statute, a, a lasting statute. They, and then they should get half of it in the morning and half of it at night. It should be cooked in a pan. And as they cook it, you want to mix it with oil. Uh, and when it is baked, Thou shalt bring it in, and thou shalt bring thou shalt bring it in, and the baked pieces of the meat offering shall thou offer for a sweet aroma unto the Lord. And the priest of of his sons that is anointed in his stead shall offer it. It is a statute forever unto the Lord, and it is completely burnt. That word holy is completely. It's completely burnt. Amen. For every meat offering of the priest shall be completely burnt. It shall not be it shall not be eaten. And the Lord spake unto and again that's the that's the burnt offering, if you will. As they given it, as the priest are offering it, it's going to be completely burnt, wholly burnt. Amen. And the Lord receives that. And this shall be given in the day of of the anointing of the son so anybody that comes into the priest office this is the ceremony and this is the protocol of their ceremony the way god expects it to be done uh, verse 23 for the meat offering of the priest shall be wholly burnt 24 the lord spake unto moses saying speak unto aaron and his two sons saying this is the law concerning the sin offering in the place where the burnt offering is killed, shall the sin offering be killed before the Lord. It is most holy, or in this case, it's very holy. Amen. Um, the priest that offer it uh, for sin shall eat it. In the holy place shall it be eaten. In the court of the tabernacle of the congregation. Whatever touch the flesh of it, 
will be made holy. That's what it's saying here. As it's, as you see it say, whatever, whatsoever shall touch the flesh thereof shall be holy. It's saying whatever touch it, it's going to be made holy. So it so whatever touch it needs to be holy is what it's saying here. Uh, and when there is when there is sprinkled of the blood thereof upon any garment, thou shalt wash that thereon it was sprinkled in the holy place. So if you're in a holy place and there's blood from the offering that gets on the garment, you are to wash that garment within the holy place where this blood came on. You don't take it outside the holy place and try to wash it. You wash it in there. Amen. It goes on to say in verse 28, but the earthen vessel, that earthen vessel is like a clay, uh, a, a clay pot, if you will. The earthen vessel wherein it was boiled, we're talking about the sacrificial uh, uh, flesh offering, wherein it was boiled, shall be broken. So that the, the clay pot, the earthen vessel is considered to be somewhat of a clay pot that was used to, to boil the sacrificial uh, flesh offering. Once you're done boil it, boiling it in that clay pot, you are to break it. Uh, so it says, but the earthen vessel wherein it is sodden, that word sodden is boiled, shall be broken. And if it be boiled in a, in a brazen pot, which is a bronze pot, uh, it shall be scrubbed, scoured, scrubbed, and rinsed with water. All the males among the priests shall eat thereof. Amen. It is very holy. And no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation uh, to reconcile withal in the holy place. Now, this holy place that it's talking about is the holy of the holies place. It says, no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile withal in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burnt in the fire. Remember when they take that blood and they sprinkle it onto the veil and stuff like that. What it says that that the 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 offerings that they're using to you you know as far as the blood goes, that cannot be eaten. That portion, you know how the priests are allowed to eat some of the sin offerings. Well, anything that that you have to take and and spray sprinkle the blood and stuff that cannot be eaten. That thing that whole thing has to be burned holy completely amen so hopefully you got some understanding uh, uh from our bible study here leviticus 5 and 6 had a good time and i bless the lord uh, for any simplicity that he gives us all the glory be to god for even allowing us to come together in bible study so in our next recording lord willing we'll pick up chapter 7 amen uh folks go with me to um probably uh Go with me real quick to, to Romans 10 and 9. Uh, Romans 10 and 9. Romans 10 and 9. Let's look at what this says here. Actually, let's start at Romans 10 and 6, if you will. It says, But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaketh on this wise those that walk by faith this is those that have an understanding uh in in faith if you will this is the same from the people of faith say not in thine heart who shall ascend into heaven that is to bring christ down from above or who shall descend into the deep that is to bring christ up from the again from the dead but what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. So it says people of faith know better. We're not going to tell you that you need, in order to be saved, you need to climb to the top of the mountains to get into heaven, you know, and to get God to notice you so that you can be saved. People of faith is not going to tell you that you got to go down to the lowest valley, down to the abyss, if you will, in order to find Christ there. Then once you find him, 
you know, you, you got to help lift them up, you know, to be saved. They're not going to come at you with that. People that are saved know how to tell you how to be saved. And they're going to tell you something simple, that the word is right next to you. And it don't take you to go to the highest mountain or to the lowest valleys. It don't take you to go and, and, and go to a priest and get seven or ten Hail Marys in order to be saved. It don't take none of that stuff for you to receive salvation. You got to understand something. You... Everybody that that was saved was saved out of sin. That means they didn't have to go out and be good so that they can be saved. As a matter of fact, you were saved when you were at your worst. You were not at your best when you were saved. It wasn't like you went and helped some lady across the street or you were standing in a fast food line and then you paid for somebody's uh, uh, so for somebody's lunch and that got you saved it wasn't the work that got you saved it was the faith in your heart that got you saved and the candidates of being saved are those that the scripture says it's those that need a doctor that's who I came for those that are sick amen you got people that are saying I, I'm just not ready yet it's like I, I'd rather to have my life be ready before I, I, I get saved. Wait a minute. If that was possible, you wouldn't need the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you could get your life together, then what did you need Jesus for? That's just a cop out to hear people say, when I come to this, I want to be real. I'm not ready. I, I'd rather be real. Well, if you, you, can only, you can only be real through Christ Jesus. I don't know how else you can, I don't know how else that can happen for you. But let's go on with this. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thine heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. It goes on to say that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. It's that simple. It don't, <coughs> again, it don't take you going to the mountain or to the valleys. It don't take you to go to everybody's church. It don't take you out here doing good and great works to be saved. It takes a it takes a confession from your mouth. Remember, we talked about earlier how how words, how we have to give an account for every idle word. The things that we say from our mouth, what you confess from your mouth and believe in your heart. That's, that's, that's it. That's what gets you saved. Why would you want to be saved though? I mean, do you, this life is, is this life is a, um, I don't want to call it a difficult life because to call it a difficult life is to say that I'm doing things by my own power. What I can tell you is that it's difficult to walk with God when you have so many things trying to pull you away from God. See, it's God that keeps your feet from slipping. However, when you begin to get pulled away from God, therein does your feet start to slip. You understand what I'm saying? But as you walk with God, you begin to get stronger. Things that you used to say yes to, you begin to say no to. And things that you used to say no to, you begin to say yes to. Because you are riding off of God's strength. You are becoming an, an overcomer. What God has given the Lord Jesus Christ, he begins to give us. He begins to give Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, strength when Jesus was here through prayer. Same thing happens with us. But all of it starts with the confession from our mouth and the belief within our heart that God did send the Lord Jesus Christ and then raised Jesus from the dead when Jesus gave his life. God raised him from the dead. Amen. So it goes on to say in verse 10, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Not the work, not, not, it says with your heart you believe unto righteousness. Not with the works that you do, with the works that you do, you do works unto righteousness. No, with your heart man believeth unto righteousness. Huh? It, 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 you a candidate to be saved, not based on how good you are, but based on how bad you are. You are a candidate to be saved. Huh? But you got to want to, 
You got to want to come out of the mess that you're in. Watch what it says here. For the scripture says, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. He will not disappoint you. If you let him lead you, if you let Jesus save you, he won't disappoint you. His, the power of God works in Christ Jesus. And once you let Jesus save you, you come into the fold. You come into to the covering. That same covering that was over Christ Jesus now begins to come over you. Huh? You come into Christ Jesus' fold. You become his sheep. Amen? So he says he won't disappoint you. That word maketh the shame means he won't disappoint you. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Why? Why wouldn't you want to be saved right now? There are people that when you try to tell them about what's going on in life, about what's going on with 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 our local with our local state and federal governments, the corruptions, um, the weather, a lot of people don't want to have to hear that because if they're forced to really hear and receive it, then they have to acknowledge that there is something going on beyond their control and it may not get better and it's going to take it's going to take them walking with God to be able to get through this a lot of people don't want to have to hear that so they're shy away from that then you have a segment of an uh, uh, of society that believes that things couldn't be better those are the people that are under delusions they're in the midst of delusion you got some people that just don't want to be bothered and people that's living, they taking advantage of everything that the day has to offer. They're going to every party. They're doing every drug. They're, they're taking advantage to what life has to offer and they think that they're going to be all right. They think they're going to be all right. If you know that something is wrong, you look at the economies, the, they say the job market is, is great. They, they're saying that the job reports, few and few people are filing unemployment claims. You, you're hearing these reports that things are getting better. But you know in your heart, something is not right. You know in your heart, you, as you've been sleeping, you get in dreams that you don't even understand. And it's, these dreams are from people that you done dreamed that you, you haven't seen these people in years. And all of a sudden you're laying and you're dreaming about these people. You know something ain't right. You know something ain't right. You're starting to have more compassion you're you're starting to become more convicted those things that you i'm i'm going to do what i want to do you can't do that anymore without feeling convicted you know something ain't right and let me tell you what's going on you are called to be saved that's why you're starting to have a conscience about things that you're doing that's why you're in bed and 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 as you're dreaming you you come you're having these dreams to what you can't even understand why and you know that there's something about these dreams the reason why you are called to be saved and you are being tapped on your shoulder saying it's time to come out of your mess it's time to come out and and what what can you tell yourself i want to be right before i get in church good luck with that no one is right by their own accord we don't wear garments of righteousness that we've sewn ourselves. Anything that we wear, it's given to us by God. Our job is to make sure that they're not stained. Good luck with that. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You, wait, you keep waiting for you to be better 
thinking that it takes you to be better to be a recipient or a candidate of being saved. Jesus says, I came not for, for those that are not sick. I came for those that are sick. He said, for those that are not sick, they don't need a physician. It's those that are sick that needs me. Those that, those that think that they got this thing sewn up, I didn't come for you. I came for those that, that, that struggling. I came for those. This is what Christ is saying in his word. I didn't come for those those that don't need me, I came for those that do need me. I don't know how much time we got, but I wouldn't want to gamble on it. Every day there is something that I have to repent for. But let me tell you something. I bless God that he makes me aware of what I do wrong. So that I don't keep doing those things wrong. And if there's something that I that's habitual within myself that I can't change, I ask him with all sincerity, Lord, take this away. I don't want to hurt you with this. I don't want to keep being in, embarrassed. I don't want to disappoint you. Take this away. But this is the relationship that we got with him. He wants to save you. Because he loves you. He loves you. He loves everything about you. He knew what you were going to do and what you would accomplish before he made you. The gifts that you got inside you, the things that you do, that you are able to do that many other people can't do. He's blessed you with skills. He know everything there is to know about you. You can't tell me he ain't been looking in on you and you ain't been noticing that. That's what your dreams are for. If you are ready to call upon the name of the Lord so that you can be saved, he says that he will not disappoint you. You won't be made ashamed. You won't be ashamed. He will not disappoint you. But it all starts with you calling on them so that you can be saved. This is bringing forth fruits worthy of repentance. This is your, your fruits right here. You're saying, I want to give myself to you. I want to put myself on the altar. I want to be burned holy, have my old ways burned off. I want to give myself to you. If you are ready to give yourself over to the Lord Jesus Christ so that you can be saved, so that you can have an eternal address change. If you are ready for this, then repeat this after me. You say, Lord, God in heaven. I come to you right now, God. And I come to you just as I am, Lord. You know where I've been. And you know where I am. Father, I've, I acknowledge my sins to you. Everything that I've done wrong, God. And I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry for those things that broke your heart. I'm sorry that I've been rebellious, God. I confess that I am not able to change myself, Lord. I need your help and I need your hand and I need your heart, God. Father, I believe that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, down to this earth. And I believe that in the course of Jesus' 33 years, Lord, that at the end, he gave his life that we may have life eternally with you. I believe that on the third day of his death, I believe by the power that lieth within you, God, you rose Jesus up from the dead. And soon after, ascended him up into heaven where he remains alive this very day 
and forevermore. Now you got to call Jesus. You got to call on the name of Jesus. You say, Jesus. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I call on you right now, Lord, to save me. Save me from myself, Lord. Save me from those things that I've given in to, Lord. Wash me. Sanctify me, Lord. Purify me, Lord. Strengthen me, God. Live in me and live through me, Lord. Break every chain. Break every addiction, God. Sanctify me in your blood, God. Jesus, I believe on you. And I believe that you are alive this day. I want to be a patient. I'm, I'm in need of my doctor, Jesus. Save me, Lord. I'm ready to live for you right now, God. Those things that I keep giving in to, Lord, give me strength to deny these things, Lord. You'll forever be my God. Thank you, Jesus. If you said it and you meant it, with the mouth we confess, with the heart we believe. If you confessed it and you've meant it, he heard you and he has saved you. Amen. That's all it takes. Remember, it don't take you having to go up to a mountain. It don't, have, it don't take you having to go down to the lowest valley. It takes the faith. And God has given you the gift of faith to believe that he is and that he is able to save you. He's already given you that faith. The fact that you believe that he is real and that he gave Jesus Christ to us. He gave you the gift to be saved, which means he wrote your name in his book. Amen. Now. Last but not least, we want to make sure that we get you baptized. And all what baptism does is it represents a ceremonial for us. It represents us, our, our, our burial and our resurrection in Christ Jesus. It is to say that, that uh, the man of God will take us and submerge us into some water. Amen. And uh, it represents us being buried in Christ. And then immediately the man of God is going to bring you up from the water. Amen. It is our resurrection. It shows our resurrection in Christ Jesus. There will be a true uh, a resurrection to come during a transformation. But right now, this is our, our, our burying and our resurrection in Christ Jesus, which is done under the uh, uh, pretense of uh, baptism. So you want to make sure that you get that done. Uh, if you don't know where to go, pray about it. Uh, call somebody. Let them know that I... I I've surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. He saved me and I want to be I want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That man of God is going to take you if he need to a real man of God. If he need to uh, will come to your home and baptize you in the tub. It's not where you it's it's, it's not a, a, a lake or something that you got to have done. It's just a process of you getting it done. Nevertheless, a man of God probably have you go out to his place of worship and he'll baptize you and uh, uh, God will lead you to a place that he wants you to, to learn and grow so that you can contribute to, uh, with the gifts that God is, has uh, uh, designed you with, if you will. Amen. Folks, I had a good time. Let me do this real quick. Uh, those of you, we have received donations to our ministry, folks, and I bless God for you. Um, those of you that have given me your given your questions and comments, uh, those of you that have blessed our ministry uh, 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 through words of edification and and encouragement, that's just as good even as in the in the, in, the, in finances. And because sometimes we get a little discouraged because we feel like we could be doing more or or what have you. And uh, sometimes when we get busy off into other things. Uh, the Lord will tap us on the shoulder through your obedience. Uh, you'll email us and say, "Look, these Bible studies. I want to. We had a brother to send <laughs> a brother. 
uh, and I bless God for him. He he sent us an email. Uh, we hadn't started Leviticus yet. It had been a long time since we recorded another Bible study. And my brother came and was like, look, first of all, I'm a young man. Um, you know, and, and, and I just started reading the word and I really appreciate it. Don't stop doing this, man. I, you know, if you could just go ahead and record some more. But that's the Lord letting me know that it's time for you to get back to working in, in this area over here because his sheep need to be fed at least to this extent. So uh, we bless you, folks. Uh, we Whatever we do, we do for God. We give him the glory. We give him the honor. But we all need one another. Amen. So let's make sure that we pray ye one for another and be here one for another. Amen. Until he bring us collectively in the sky with him. Until we meet. Uh, shots out to my brother Scott Almeida, my sister Cheryl, uh, brother brother Edward Till, um, and many others. Uh, Cynthia, sister Cynthia Adams. God bless you, my sister. Uh, until we meet again, folks, I love you, my wife. <laughs> bless you. We're looking forward to uh, 10 years. Uh, so we're excited about it and, and I give honor to my wife because uh, she's the one that's as this recording finishes she'll be the one to take and do all the editing everything that you see on the website is what she's done uh, she has a heart for God's people she's a mighty woman of God amen so I bless God to have her in my life and to have her as my help my friend and my wife Folks, until we meet again, peace be upon you and your families. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and happy holidays to you folks. I love you, and thank you for allowing us to be part of your bodies, your body, your Bible studies. God bless you. Amen and amen.